All right. So in general, we will we'll start on time and we'll finish it because of insanity. We'll finish it 75 minutes after that because that's yeah right. Um, <clears throat> because that's in the slot and I yeah. Uh, so that doesn't mean I'm on time for anything else. But uh, <laughs> but uh, apparently I think this is important. All right. So um, teaching. Yes. There's just a billion text messages from my oldest daughter who's about to sit in her first class of college and she's extremely nervous about the whole thing. Anyway, it's okay. It's a family situation. All right. So um, what can I tell you? So a few things just, just, just for your amusement or mine, I suppose this is, um, this is org mode in Emacs, right? So there are all these organization systems in the world. Probably the best ones are pieces of paper, but, um, if you get into, into Emacs and it's an, basically an infinite space, um, and then Vim people will try to murder you and you know get very angry, and most people won't know what you're talking about. My experience is Emacs people are generally pretty nice, but the Vim people not happy. They're really mad about everything. Anyway, so, but it's it's kind of fun. You can just you can easily let's like let's make another one and then, right? You just sort of it's all text based. If you want to put in say another date or something like this, it's 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 pretty good. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, I suppose. But um, anyway, so. Uh, like dot, and you can say plus seven days from now, and it would make a. You want to know what happened there? Oh. So the little space, that little touch bar, which is going to be killed by Apple, right? Like, isn't that right? That's gone, I think. The little, there's this little touch bar thing. Anyway, it hangs out there, and, and I, it had an option to destroy the universe, and I pressed it. So you'd think that's a design flaw. Anyway. Org mode is sitting there if you want to have a crazy existence, but uh, this is just a tiny bit of org mode. Tables are very nice, but that's what's going on behind here. So I was going to show you a couple of uh, fun things about COVID right now. Um, I believe we've recorded some, actually, I, I believe there are some cases at UVM now, but I only know that from my youngest daughter who's taking a course and her professor said some people couldn't come because their roommates have COVID. So it's very indirect information. The reporting system, not great, which has been a big feature of the pandemic. At UVM? Great. I've been amusing myself by thinking that um, this is a Perl thing, but this would be, you know, uh, speech text of from admin, something like this would be. Um, replace uh, students everywhere with money <laughs> globally. So we'll be testing the money every week. We're, we welcome the money back into the classroom. I just love it for one of them to slip up and say money instead of students. But look, I'm here for good reasons. Um, it's a big machine, I understand. Knowledge is great, okay. So uh, let's see. So Vietnam, yes. Um, right, we'll talk later because uh, you know, contagion is part of the course later on. Um, biological and social contagion. Pandemics has been a long part of this, you know, long, long been part of this course from the start. And, uh, you know, one of the things that people have carried with them for so long are these ridiculously simple models, which are fine. Let's get a Reuters one here, I think. But, you know, the, the simple models, as we'll talk about later, right, the, people start to get sick. It's, it's for the for big presumption is random mixing, which obviously doesn't happen at the scale of the world. Uh, but we, we sort of pretend it does in a lot of these models, which is ridiculous. But this is Vietnam, right, which famously, I mean, I think in my sort of world of pandemic studying, people did incredibly well early on, right? And they're... they're um, you know, of course, locally to, to China, where there have been outbreaks, SARS and, and things going back, people have been wearing masks for a long time. They've been thinking about how to defend themselves against pandemics. So uh, they did they did well, but there's just this huge pressure of everyone around you. Eventually, it's not surprising. Someone just, you know, and this is a different country, right? Someone got sentenced to five years in prison for traveling outside of a zone and, um, 
was understood to have infected eight people, one person died. And of course, you know, all these things cascade. But this is a, you know, nothing, right? So, I mean, how do you model this? How do you predict this? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, so that's important. They really had nothing early on. I mean, and you worry about some of the reporting in some places, though I don't think Vietnam was a was problematic there. So to get to the reporting, and I've mentioned this before, um, right, so the Balkans were like this too, not much, and then off, you know, Peru, very, very different early on. So I did show you something from The Economist early on about, and we talked about that with um, excess deaths. And so this is a thing that I said, wave flag, you know, pointlessly, I suppose, but wave flags about early on, you know, we need to measure just total death toll because that gives you the impact at least of a pandemic, right? Because it can be, can be if you do it, if you go into complete lockdown, that, you know, deaths might go down, for example. And we've seen that in some countries. There are less deaths than normal, like New Zealand, for example. And you start to think about car crashes, the stuff that we just have a standard number from. Um, homicides are a whole, you know, another piece, right? So how does that change when you're in this completely different context? So this hasn't, no one has really done this very well. And, and of course, this is a, um, you know, a news outfit. Uh, and so when, I'm not going to tell you this is right or anything, but it's, it's an effort to estimate the total number of excess deaths so far, right? That's, that's a hard thing. And it's not just from COVID, it's from lots of sources. But this is a kind of thing. I mean, there is a number in the middle and people will go with that, unfortunately, and say, you know, there've been 9.4 million exits. No, right? There have been we don't know. It's between 9 and 18 million, according to this model, and that's a 95% confidence interval. Again, according to this model, all sorts of problems with the data, the model itself. But this, you know, it's not 100 million, and it's not, you know, we're wrong and it's a million. It's because we're starting to really, you know, you've got to be in orders of magnitude here. So, you know, does this matter, right? Like, is this, is this something that, because people are all over the place on this now. Uh, so, and then there's the uh, country, you know, you can look at which countries have reported what, right? So uh, as you might expect, you know, Russia is, Russia is famous, you know, early on, they, don't, they didn't have any uh, deaths at all from COVID, but that's not what we're looking at here. We're just looking at excess deaths, which they do seem to report, right? I think that's true of China as well. So uh, let's get to some... Some of these things there are different versions here to look at. So this is this is just a daily. So you can see the cumulative. You can see the uncertainty growing. So this is kind of what you'd want. This is not a right. This model didn't start back here and say this is what we'll think. It's always adjusting, right? It's trying to figure out what what might have been happening in the past. So it's just a it's a now cast, right? This forecasting now casting, and you know the incredibly difficult problem actually of just saying what happened, which is which is hard. Uh, so, right. So here's the here's the you know the more recent big spread. So India is involved here as well, and that's that's total. You want to look at per one hundred thousand. It won't change this graph too much. The shape's going to look the same. Uh, but I think I want to go down to countries. So Russia, for example. So the data is not as good, right? So it's it's more patchily reported. Uh, these are the actual excess deaths. Uh, the the U.S. of course. You know, they were reporting COVID early on, but we have no idea. If you look at any graph from the, from the start that shows you how many cases there were, this is all wrong, right? These are all undercounts, um, which, which we knew straight away. And what I thought was a spectacular bit of disinformation was to say there are overcounts, right? I mean, this, this is a very basic kind of, you know, you know device for, for saying the other side is wrong is to claim the opposite, right? This is the time-honored sort of tradition that happens in families. It goes all the way up to, to states. But it was to say, you know, the, that uh, hospitals and doctors and so on are over-reporting these things so they'll get money and whatever. So it's not that, it's not that uh, the cases are a bit off or something, or you're saying it's under-reported and it's really not like that. You actually say the opposite, right? And then the anchor is completely changed. And uh, so well done there. And you can see what's happened recently. We just don't, it's not that excess deaths plummeted it's, we don't have that data, right? So that data is sort of falling apart uh, in, you know, in the recent weeks, and this will fill in. Horribly, this will fill in as, as the information gets centralized in the US to the CDC, for example. 
And then these are efforts to estimate where it is now. Sorry. Okay, so I thought we could look at some. Yeah, so these, these uh, right. So there are many more countries here to look at. These are interesting things to order, and it's ordered by excess deaths. So this is total. So India may have had 7 million. Again, this is, the, this is a range, right? So this is a 95%, one to maybe seven. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And yes, there's a Stalin quote for that as well. Um, but per 100,000, this is the official COVID deaths. You want to look at the normalized part. And of course, then you see something. It's a very different ordering. Peru, Hungary, we've seen, I've shown you this, I think, in the very first lecture. I mean, this is a, the, you know, South America and the, and the Balkans really sort of stand up here. But that's the official. And then if you go to, um, this is just excess deaths. So this is from all source, um, all causes. Then you start to see some some things change, right? So Peru seems to have done a good job in, in terms of reporting what's happened. But suddenly you see Iraq, which wasn't you know on this list at all, uh, just jump enormously. So instead of maybe 20, it could be up to, you know, it's 80 to 400. These are huge ranges. These ranges are a little, I mean, I understand when they've used thousands. Uh, it's okay. Maybe some bars could help here as well. Actually, I think nice table plots are actually, there are bars and the numbers as well. So, um, but I think there are some pretty big variations. Um, so, you know, Russia, for example, you know, this is a huge differential. And if you go by percentage, you know, what's, how far off they are. So you're going to get smaller countries, right? So the smaller countries are going to appear here as well. Uh, but China's here, right? With, they're off by 12,000%. Um, it's a big country. So, you know, in terms of the actual numbers, it's, not as many, but so, you know, the official number there is 5,000. This estimate is 150 to one and a half million. So, and, and you know, we knew this back with SARS. We had no idea how many people had died from, from SARS in, in China. So, like, are those huge ranges, like, is that going to be, like, bad data or, like, huge populations or, like, some combination? Like, how do you... Yeah, so we'd have to dig into what they've done for, for a specific country like China. Um, they do... Uh, <laughs> because you're trying to pull together other official numbers, um, which are hard to get. So, you know, I think with, with um, Peru, there's trust, I suppose, in their reporting. Um, but China's just so, uh, it's so difficult to get numbers from that we're that far off. Uh, let's see, do we get a good... So, and I, I'm not going to say this is right. And it is problematic, perhaps, to show it. But this is like the only effort I've seen to to do this. I mean, we could have done this as well, but I mean, it's just sort of exhaustion. Um, all right, I won't. Uh, so there's a lot here. It's on GitHub, right? They're trying to do a good job. Tons of data. They're trying to go subnational, all these sorts of things, because yes, you want it from all the states, for example, in the US, because you want to pull it together. Um, but yeah. So. Right, China's had a special treatment here, for example, right? They, they, I don't know if you can read that, but they're trying to, you know, adjust things for, they just don't have the data. Yes, so, so it's a vastly different story. That's everywhere. Should we get back up here? And then you get to countries that have actually, you know, excess deaths, as it works out, they've been less, right? So New Zealand has had, um, you know, 2,000 per, you know, less deaths than, ex than you would expect based on, and I don't know what they've done here the last five years, for example. Um, then you start to see all sorts of arguments about, well, did they have bad flu seasons in the last five years? Da, 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 right? Like what's the, you know. Anyway, so if this is, an, this data set is something to look at too. It could be a part of a project if people want to think about this too much more. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. So quickly, I'll show you this one and then we'll get back to the you've probably seen this and maybe you can read the things. But here's the headline. Right. So which state did this happen in? So this is a I, um, I guess in my, you know. 
catalog of pathetic tweets that get, you know, 10, 10 likes at most or something, you know, what's the point? But I tweeted something like, um, it was based on some data, right, for how we were doing per capita versus everywhere else. I think Hawaii's maybe better usually, but, uh, you know, the bumper sticker for, for Vermont could be the least stupid state, right? It doesn't mean smart, right? It's just the least stupid. But anyway, this is a, you know, maybe maybe we're, we're going to get challenged a little bit there. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I just, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to um, rampage on with the scaling thing. I've tried to fix some things that blew up. Let's see if I find other things that blew up. Um, and I want to start on the power law size distributions thing. And then maybe I'll do the introductions next, next week. I'll introduce the course. All right, so, okay, it's a cold open. So we have this story that, um, pop this up, that, uh, I mean, it's incredibly beguiling, right? So that this, uh, the, how things scale in cities, if they're social in some way, and they can be good or bad things, right? Could be diseases um, or say, you know, wealth or just ideas as measured by patents, then, um, there's a super linear scaling, right? So that's, let's build bigger cities. But, and, and there's a, this is a nice story as well, right? So, okay, people aren't changing how much they're using, but that's a hard thing to measure, right? There are lights, there are, this, these are hard things to measure. And this is just the, the first study that really went in this direction. Uh, so then there's, um, and then, you know, this, this uh, I guess I'm reading the wrong way, but the sublinear uh, part, which is uh, infrastructure, right? So in terms of, road and road surface and so on, it, that's helpful. This is a bit odd. Density doesn't seem to matter. And so there've been some efforts, of course, after that and by the same authors. All right, and I showed you this thing quickly, which we, you know, nice thing for us with the looking at residuals. So it's a very natural thing to do, but you have to understand the scaling to subtract it off properly. Okay, that's a theoretical thing. We'll see if that holds up. All right, so this is where we were. Um, and this is some, follow-up work, and they find some, some different things. It's based on data in, so that first data was China, some from Europe, I think Germany, and the US, right? So it's a mixture. Uh, this is gonna be from Brazil and the US. So it's about suicide, which is, you know, there's serious things, um, awful things. And uh, so all of these social things were suspected to follow maybe a, you know, this, what, that, that was their sort of big, frame, um, well, Claim. I mean, you know, they're not saying this is proven or anything, but just sort of a, a suggestion that came out of it was that social things that have social nature to them might scale super linearly. Uh, these are three pieces that are quite, you know, they're social in different, you know, peculiar ways. Uh, traffic, of course, I think this is just vehicle traffic, so it's not going to include um, public transport. Uh, so different things here. So we've got super linear scaling for homicide. And as to what, you know, this complicated thing to figure out. Traffic accidents, though, seem to be more of a linear scaling piece, which I don't know. I mean, you've got to start to look at the infrastructure and, and so on. And then something you would think would, you know, this, this is more of the, this is the exponent, that, which is an infrastructure exponent, um, seems to be sublinear. So, uh, you know, and there are many just so stories about uh, what cities do to people and right, the, 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 the anime and so on has been thought about for a long time, but this would sort of go against the big cities are terrible places to live in. This again is scaled relative to population, is that right? Sorry, yes. Yeah. So all of this is for population, right? So this is all variable of interest proportional to n to the beta or beta. <laughs> um, and, and then there's nothing about density in there, which is, so just some of the scalings, I mean, we can just look at it. I mean, at least they've used log 10, but you can't, I mean, it's useful as much as you can to put things on the same scale, which they do over here. But uh, these are the same ranges here. You can see some differences. Um, uh, right, that's just the correlation coefficient. So this slope, I mean, that's a power, you know, it's scaling, right? This is a little messy in here and there's a lot of, uh, 
worry mum might have about fitting things. And they've tried to fit it. I did this years ago too. They've tried to do a little like sort of a, a fit that's not just one big straight line. They're, they're trying to be a little um, sneaker about that. But if you divide by population, then you get what we sort of, uh, what, what, what has to happen is the traffic is a constant, suicide is going down and um, homicides are going up. That, you know, there's no, exp there's no explanation for this, but it's, it was, um, you know, a thing to think about. And it's like, oh, this is a departure from what else was going yes. Well, yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're, they're um, broad brushed. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, and they, they didn't look at everything that was infrastructure. And if they had, for, but see, if they had this suicide plot in there, the story would have broken a little bit, right? They couldn't, they, they would have had this one thing that wasn't the same. I don't, I mean, heaven forbid they actually did that, right? But this is what scientists do. Um, but they're, you know, well, I want to go back to it, but they're able to kind of bin them and, you know, the, the things for infrastructure are just like uh, wiring and road surface, right? You know, the double the population, you do, don't double the, the road surface that's needed. Um, so I'm just throwing out there, I mean, a lot of this is, this is a collection of crazy scalings. That's some more for that one. We don't need to look at it. This is something we'll come back to later on. It does appear in um, Pox too, because there's a, a reason for connecting in there. But we'll tie it into uh, the robustness story, high, highly optimized tolerance. And this is, this is really a profound thing. This, this gets towards the, what I would call the scaling of, um, of justice or fairness, right? So this is, this, there's some really important things in here. And this is, again, something that is a bit of a harder thing to, to measure. So I don't think it's been done well. And I think there's a whole world of measuring uh, characteristics about populations that uh, we could we could perform and, and then really show, you know, like th there's a looking at the residuals, you can say, look, there's a real app. It's, 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 a, it's a quantitative way of getting at social deserts, right? So there's food deserts are sort of a well-known thing, but I think there's a much more general uh, space in there around social deserts. So things like, I mean, there's been a lot of study of gerrymandering, it's different than that, but things like voting booths, you know, like how easy is it for you to vote? Um, and so what you start to think about here is population is distributed across countries. It's always pretty much in, you know, heterogeneous. That's just sort of a function of how humans, right? We have cities, there's geography, and we'll get to that um, with power law size distributions. So, so we've got a heterogeneous, we've got this uneven population, you know, wildly, wildly uneven, right? People living in, you know, and single by themselves out in the woods. And then, you know, someone in Manhattan, you know, living in a building um, where murders only take place in the building or whatever it is, you know, it's a, just an incredible density. Um, so you've got this big variation, but then start to think of the facilities, schools, coffee shops, you know, basic things like that, post offices, fire departments. So how are they all spaced around? How do they kind of um, get allocated purposefully or accidentally through history? Um, I know I, I, I'm just going to touch on it here. There's a really interesting study of post offices in the U.S., which I, I think I showed. Uh, and it's a great visualization where you can just see them, you know, marching across the to the West as the U.S., um, you know, the the, the states kind of come into existence and and then but then um, starting to blink out, starting to disappear as, as cars come along. Uh, and so you can start to think about, you know, how do people have access to spaces? Well, it was always walking and horses and carts, and then it becomes cars, right? And it transforms things. But it's it's really about time, right? So here are just two examples. This is. Uh, this one, as I recall, this is, yes, so this is, this is an interesting one. This is an ambulatory hospital. So as population density goes up, the density of these hospitals tends to increase superlinearly, right? So you're actually getting more, they're more dense, the more dense the population is. This is a pretty big range. 
This one is sub linear quite strongly, um, and this is public schools in the US. This is from a study that looked at the US and South Korea, quite different places. Uh, and and this, this is the thing where you start to think maybe that's a two thirds, and that indeed there's an argument for this being two thirds, and the D dimension is two, and that's our two dimensional world we live in. So it's, it turns out you can argue that this is a two over two plus one. Right, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, this is different, and this is so. This is a this can be argued for minimizing the average time it takes everyone to get to the facility. So in this case, schools. This is maximizing the people that come in. So you've got your Starbucks, and then there's a Starbucks around the corner, or there's McDonald's, right? Which you know is the way it works. Uh, but you don't put one out in the middle of the desert. But there are little public schools all over the place, right? Because we we're, we're trying to help the world. Uh, okay, completely different thing. This is again, a, you know, humans. This is work by Neil Johnson, who's, who's spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. Uh, he has, do I have his other one? No. Anyway, this is, and we'll come back to it with rights law and so on. This is the time between uh, terrorist attacks and, and looking in particular at uh, uh, IEDs, and this is in Afghanistan, right? So this is in the early, well, the first half of the war, unbelievably. Um, so the, what happens is the time between events decreases, right? There's, this is a, and this can be viewed in organizational terms, this is a, or educate, this is a learning, this is a, a reflective of learning, getting better at doing something. Uh, so, and then you can measure, you can see how these gaps um, collapse and you can start to measure exponents. So this is the nth event. This is the time between the n and n plus oneth event. And so it's, you know, it's pretty messy. It's still going to be, there's still going to be a lot of variation, but it's going down slowly. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is a, a difficult thing to measure, obviously. Um, and then he has an argument for, you know, it's sort of a little physics model argument of, of uh, groups kind of breaking apart and joining together and, and various other things. Anyway, so just to show you something quite different. So that's in science 10 years ago. I think he had one in nature maybe five years ago, which was, um, is that right? Yeah, the ecology of war was the framing there. But you can see as time goes on whether, uh, right, so it might become, you know, of course, eventually this can change dramatically, right? It can become a static thing where it's, it's settled or it, they could become spaced apart, which is like a, a de-escalation. We don't, we don't have to look at this, but money obviously goes off through a lot of scales and there's a, um, I mean, it's pretty unfathomable what these things are. And in terms of social behavior, right? So, I, I mean, I think of language as being our great social um, invention uh, and, and then money on the side of it, which is, which is belief, right? We've managed to put belief into these abstract things, which is pretty crazy. So, so this is something about belief, but of course we've got algorithms and machines on top of it as well. And I'm not sure if they believe in things uh, and talk about gold standards. Okay, so money, lots of scaling in money. Again, another place where it's just orders of magnitude of variation. Um, Right, so towards the end, I'll give you an assignment question just to sort of have it in there, which is um, to do with the 99%, the right? That framing or the 1% framing, which doesn't really tell you anything if you step back from it. It works, you know, as a device, but uh, there's a top 1% of anything. It doesn't tell you how much they have, right? So when we start to think of these um, long tail distributions of wealth, you know, what what, how does that translate into the one? What does the 1% actually have? What does the 0.1% actually have? And, and so on. How do we connect that to these distributions? And, you know, rubber barons and things. Okay, so this is a really, this is a lovely uh, piece of work. Um, and it's, yeah, it's 14 years ago now, but it got itself into nature, which is hard, right? Nature doesn't, as I think they make their money out of um, advertising about mice and stuff like that. So it tends to be a lot of uh, biology stuff. Usually there's a dinosaur one because that's fun and maybe some uh, science, maybe some Mars stuff, but lots of biology with uh, completely uh, intractable um, titles. Anyway, now and then you get some fun things as well. 
So this is the evolution of uh, the a conjugation of verbs in English, looking in particular at the past tense, right? So language is a code, right? And so over time, well, if we just focus on English, English is a particularly odd biz business, right? I mean, most languages are, but it's there's a number of invasions. And um, so French got injected in there, uh, for example. And then England started to invade everywhere else and started to you know, take words. So we have pajamas and, and so on. It's sort of particularly um, happy to absorb words. Anyway, that's all over, I think. Um, so, uh, so it's about, it's, so a very nice way to look at this is, as I said, it's code, right? So some things we've really simplified, like plurals. Most plurals end in S. There's a flu, you know, few floating around that have a Latin ending or whatever. People argue about, you know, whether you should say octopuses or octopi or octopodes because it's Greek. And then Jack Bailey, who's the spelling bee champion here, um, tells everyone to be quiet. Uh, anyway, octopuses. All right, so so we're looking at ED. So these are so it's Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. And people get a lot very confused about frequency of usage, but this is frequency of usage. So these are going to be to have and to be out here. Okay, let me just quickly say what's going on. This is going to be the verbs. It's about verbs. So we're going to have to be and to have. Uh, these are going to be very rare, rarely used verbs here. And then, you know, more common in the middle. And this is the number, simply the number of irregular verbs. There aren't many, right? So this is a maximum of 70 here in Old, old English. And by irregular, I mean, right? So the conjugation is not, right? So if you can introduce an irregular verb now, then that will be... Spectacular. Getting a word made is pretty good. But so Google comes along. So we, but we have, you know, I Google, you Google, they Google, right? We don't, that's a totally standard framework. But to have, you know, I have, it's an odd, odd business, some of these conjugations. Yes. How did they do it? The number of speakers? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think they do. I think that, you know, the problem is you're, what you're taking is a text corpus, which, and, and we'll get to this in the next, uh, with uh, allo taxonometry, there are types, so broadly types and tokens, right? So the types of the, the, it's the dictionary, and then there are the tokens are how they're used. And so this is trying to get at how they're used. So they're going to take text from some, you know, monks wrote a whole bunch of stuff. So you read what the monks wrote. But it doesn't tell you what you're leaving out there is which story monk stories were the most popular ones, right? So it's a bit fishy, but you're still sort of doing something like that, right? Uh, I think they're they're not going to put that in, but they uh, I don't think they have the population of English speakers or or the pressure on because it's so spectacularly. Um, complex, of course. Um, but the, the, the idea is that that is in, happening in the background. People are talking with each other, talking with each other, and the social construction and evolution of language means that some things get simplified, right? So some things get simplified and um, regularized. It might not have happened that way, but it does seem to be that we as humans have kind of clean up our language code a little bit over time. Not, not always, but so um, this is, a, there are a number of pluses. So this is the frequency of usage again, right? So this is going to be to be and to have out here. And this is as you go from um, these, these, right, these three different eras, so old to middle uh, to modern and, and then middle to modern. I guess they've used both there. Uh, this is the rate of regularization. So very rare words. What this is saying, this is a scaling thing. Very rare word, rare verbs that were irregular are vulnerable to this, right? They get regularized. They're not used as much. So when people start to say them, um, at some point someone uses a regularization and it just kind of catches, right? So, but we do as as you know as parents with kids and teachers with kids, we go we love telling them that there's no way you say teached. Like that's a terrible thing to say. Like you didn't catch, you, know, you can't say catched, you know, and it seems horrible. Like it's, it's like a visceral reaction. 
Um, but kids are all, tr- you know, they're trying to figure out what is this language thing you maniacs are going on with. And so, of course, you're going to keep trying, you know, to, to, to generalize. But we happily say with not a trace of like, this is insane, or this is why Monty Python exists because of language, you know, like, no, you know, you have to say it like this. All right. So, so the more common a verb is, the more resilient it is to change. Uh, and so they have this kind of idea of a half-life. So the frequency of usage, uh, so the more frequently used a word is, the longer its half-life is in terms of being regularized. So this little table then is the, the most regular ones, the most common, so common ones at the top, rarest ones are down the bottom. And in red, if you can see it, are the words that have been, the, the verbs that have been regularized by modern English. Uh, and if we have any champions, you can remember which, what, what, their, what their origins were, right? So, um, but these are, so, you know, stand, I stood, Right, so these are, it's, and it's all just about the past tense, the ed, whether they have ed or not. Um, <clears throat> there's the uh, e, en is a sometimes, um, or pt, you know, maybe scrapped here for t. Um, you know, but we have, we've still got broken, begun, brought. Is, so, so there are some structures in there, right? So, you know, caught and taught and brought, right? Slightly different spellings, but they have a, they come from a, particular origin. So there are little species, right? That it's trying to hold on. There are little species of things. Yes. So I guess it will have to do also with kind of what like a word will or the use of the word will change also, right? So straight oh. like now we straight data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess it's not the first time it's used. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. And we have a I think we can publish it now. We have a because someone sued LinkedIn or something. Do we have a, uh, a thousand year kind of look at that, which is the evolution of the English language in terms of meanings and um, it's an OED thing. So, so that's, yeah, that's, if you think of the, thesaur- like the thesaurus as a temporal network, you've got here, here's a word is connected to other words, like scrape, as you say, it's connected to, you know, like dragging or whatever. It's got some similar words around it. And then suddenly at some point it goes, boink, and it's got this other uh, part of the network that it's connected to. And some people see also that in terms of embedding, like right? Sure. Embedding, so, like, so, no, no, no. So this is fantastic. I've had a, a student did a beautiful thing in Parks years ago, um, on, which led to the thing I'm talking about. But it's just thinking about metaphor, right? So metaphor, yeah. right? So we do, we, okay, I'll show you, because this is one of my favorite things on, on uh so here's, here's a fantastic challenge for you. Like, be able to detect in-text metaphor and count them. Just a basic thing. Where are all the metaphors, right? So let's look this up. This is fun. Um, I can't see properly. Anything. Anything. Political speeches. Political speeches. And the reason I'll do this, right? So here's metaphor. There's a, oh, the Puck, we got married in the Puck building. Um, so there's Puck here, blah, 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 and it's like etymology. Okay, so, you know, as a type of comparison, da, 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 and then 5.2, as a foundation of our conceptual system. <laughs> Sorry, I just think it's hilarious. It stayed there forever. It's not a really long thing. I mean, Justin Bieber's thing is infinitely longer than this, but um, yeah, it's just sort of in there. This is how we think, by the way. It's George Lakoff, right? And it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that this is right, but it's just comedically funny. But we we absolutely do do this, right? We're always using it. So a lot of a lot of them are spatial, right? We even spatialize time, long time, short time. Yeah, it's pretty weird. And then so a lot of things are spatial. So like, what's the fraction of metaphors that we use that are spatial? But then they start to scaffold on top of each other, and we're using like horse and buggy analogies for cars. And then we're using car analogies for, you know, like, so because we're sort of, that's become part of the territory. Yeah. Super, super interesting. So much. Um, yeah, they really, really went out of the way. There's some other pieces here, but um, these are, this is a fun paper to, to, uh, to think about. But yeah, so there are much, so, so they got onto something that was doable, ED. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, ED is, you know, like a findable 
thing. It doesn't mean you always get it right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what this is. Um, I see what you mean. Like, how how far away are they from being like how how peculiar is their irregular yeah. nature? Yeah, no, so that's fair enough. And I think they might go in batches as well, right? So taught and caught might just go at the same time. Um, we you know we might just give up, and then you know five hundred years or something or a thousand years it will. This will seem really quaint, just as older language does. The half-lives are here. So, you know, this is not going to hold necessarily, but in 40,000 years, it will be I am, you am, he am. Which is interesting, because in some ways, if you say I am, you are, it's like we're different things. But we both jump, right? I jump, you jump. We're like totally fine with that. But my amness is different to your amness. So you could say it's it's a bad thinking actually to 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 have these basic ones you know it's, it engenders nastiness in humans right like yeah so there are a few that yeah so there are a few that end up just yeah which one was that one again yeah, so there are a few that they're right. They're lost. They get stuck. They're only used in one particular phrase, and and so they'll hang around. But we sort of, they are kind of lost, and there are lost positives as well, right? No one's gruntled, feeling super gruntled today. You're looking gruntled. Um, maybe you are. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and it's ticklish in our heads to think about that, um, but. Yeah, uh, I have it. We don't have to worry about this, but some of them. So by their reckoning at the time, wed was, and it's a, it's sort of to your point, right? Wed was the next to go because, you know, we were wedded to the idea, but two people were wed yesterday. So wedded would be the, you know, the the, the program. You know, the, like we've got the, the algorithm has been simplified, right? If we go with that. But you, that's going to be a hard one for people to adapt to because, you know, like wedding announcements or, or, you know, such and such was wed yesterday. You know, if the New York Times changes to that, you know, there'll be fights, um, uh, which is the least of the problem. But snuck, you know, snuck, you know, but this, this is a different one where it's fun to say snuck. It's just fun to say it, right? So, so you know, there, there, there are other, which is sort of, I think, connected a little bit to what, Yes, okay. Let's see if this works. So this is this doesn't mean it's right, but this is uh, in all of English, I guess, yeah. Maybe people, are, you know, this is a different meaning as well. It doesn't necessarily show you that. Let's go to English fiction. Okay. Snuck is sneaking up on... Sneaked. Snook? So this could go wrong. Yeah, uh, so it's a bit of a. So we have one. We have this similar thing for Twitter. Let's see if we can get it to work. Uh, it might not work. It's a little slow. Snuck and sneaked. Sneaked. Oh no! Oh no! All right. Demo fail. All right. Well, we published the paper. We're going to be asking for $20 million to make that better. Anyway, so. Damn it. All right. Just a few more. Uh, right? These are samplings, right? This is a smorgasbord. Um, Smorgasbord is a fun word. We have a smorgas dashboard on one of our things, which is good. Yeah, a smorgas dashboard. Okay. We'll come back to language because it's one of the great examples of scaling. And um, that was pretty, pretty beautiful work, it seemed, at the time. So 
Uh, and we did, we actually, did, we wrote, a, we had a paper on this looking at Twitter and Google Books for that regularization as well. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is Moore's Law. This is a version of Moore's Law. This is the date of introduction of um, the, a particular um, chip. And this is then, you know, it's a transistor count. So this is, this is a density thing, right? So this is just how much is being produced. Like this is a technology advance, very famous. Um, and I think it got, uh, so, you know, this was conjectured back about here actually by Moore, right? Um, so it was a pretty, pretty impressive thing to, to get right. But then it became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because everyone's like, well, we, we know we're gonna be here in two years. So some of these technologies are just different things as well. I mean, we saw that for engines as well, but people are like, yes, we're gonna keep going. And then there's quantum time out here somewhere. So, okay, so Moore's law, famous, famous thing, um, but it's connected to this as well. I don't know if I, I'm kind of worried I don't have this note here, but um, I don't think it's in these slides. There's a Pixar, right? So Toy Story is 90, Six, maybe nine, seven, like something like that. No one knows you were never born at that time. Nine five nine six, right? So back about ten years before that, they were thinking about this because they wanted to make Toy Story and they wanted it to be what it was, what it became. But they were back. All right, so Toy Story is here, but they're back here maybe ten to fifteen years before, and they said well, it was going to take that much time before we can do what we want to do because of Moore's law, which was, yeah which was pretty good because they also still made the thing, which is seemingly impossible. Okay, so this is Wright's Law. This is some good old school sciencing. Uh, this is a paper that was published in 36. And, um, but it's based on in the 20s, right? Yeah, right. So uh, just after the First World War and, and of course the great pandemic that everyone forgot about. Um, so lots of funny plots here, but this is basically, this is, no, this is the number of airplanes, right? So this is a bit similar to this terrorist attack thing, right? So this is the, like, I know it's a terrible thing to talk about, but nth IED, but it could be nth anything that, you know, someone that humans are collectively making, it could be one person, could be a team. And the, uh, this is cost is, being, is going down, right? So this, this takes a long time to get that first plane out and no one, it works and no one explodes. That's hard as well. But yeah, this is literally the for a for a company building machines, you know, machine number one, right? Yeah. So this is a this was a, a cost aspect, and there are a couple of other ways to sort of think about these and put them together. And this is a paper from just eight years ago now, uh, which I thought was very well done. So this is we'll, we'll frame it in this way, right? So we're going to have stuff. Um, the how much something costs. And I've very imaginatively used X and Y and X. Uh, and this is the total amount of stuff made by time point T. So Wright's law can be framed in this way, that it's a scaling law where the cost based on how much you've made is going down. And that, hmm. okay, well, let's see if it's in there. But so you're making things and uh, you get better at making it, you figure out you don't need those pieces or you can get supplies in this way, right? There's just lots of things that go together towards, you know, we're, we're pretty good at um, iteratively doing things uh, and improving upon them, <laughs> including, you know, terrible things, of course. Uh, and then Moore's law can be put in this way where it's the cost is going down exponentially uh, as well, right? So this it can be related to the number of things you've made and then just, as a function of time, uh, because that was tied to time. Moore's law was tied to time, it was doubling every two years. So it's not just the scale of things, but it's actually the cost. And then there's a paper that comes later, um, Sahal's paper here, that put just put them together and said, well, all right, well, these things match up um, because we could, um, you know, obviously these things are gonna be proportional to each other, so this must be true as well, right? So the amount of stuff is growing exponentially. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, that, yeah, that's it. that's the architect architect builder dichotomy, right? And it's I'm I'm sure there's been a lot of stuff done, but just sort of anecdotally, right? It's always like, I mean, even though you have, you're doing something, it's got all the, the mechanics in there and whatever. There's still it gets out there and like uh, this is going to fall on its you know like whatever. Or we don't have that plastic or it burns or something. You know, like people actually know things about you know right right. You give it to you say, can you build this? Car? And they're like no, or this house. And it's like okay, guy. You know, like you know the crazy ideas, right? Although we 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 we've manifested a lot of things that probably shouldn't be around. But anyway, so that's a. I don't know. I don't know where that might fit, but that's that's the you know that that depends how much it's it's um okay. I guess what I'm thinking about is there's an architect who hands it off and then goes and designs another thing because that's what they like to do and doesn't really versus the iterative thing where you where where you're a team and you keep talking back and forth. If it's functioning like that, then that's that's part of this. And you figure out. Can you figure out how to make it, et cetera, and then you've got charge back for more. Yes, 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 yes. You can always do, um, right, farmer brother situation. Right, yeah, yeah. So there's some terrible behaviors. And then that's, um, yeah, because, you know, one of the fundamental scarcity is one of the, yeah. So you just, re, you know, you think this, right, terrible, right, right. <sighs> yeah. Um, so you can put these together and you have these little scalings, right? So there's a, uh, a little um, time factor here. There's a scaling exponent here and then another time factor here. And if you just put them together, this is, right? So this is not hard. This is going to be, I'll do what I suppose, right? Let me see if we can do a basic thing. So, so this is the, the output. And then, of course, we have the two that we're starting with, uh, yt is proportional to xt to the minus w like this. I think it's a w. And it's also proportional to um, e to the minus mt. So these guys are the same. So that would give us, or proportional to each other, um, there's a minus w here, e to the minus mt. And then we'll take the whatever power of that thing. I'll keep writing the right wrong things, and we'd get a plus m over wt. So that would give us g is equal to plus m over w. Did I get that wrong? Okay, that works. Yeah. All right. So you could measure these things, right? So we could go out and say, well, I mean, this is this is all very nice, but we can go out and measure productions of stuff over time, and that's that's what this paper was about. And I think they had about sixty different, quite different. Products, right? So this is um, this is uh, memory, um, PVC, and just magnesium. And so this is, I mean, these these little plots are. This is actually five orders of magnitude here. I understand what they do, but this is, are they doing the right thing? Uh, ooh, that's ten to the minus eight to ten to the minus point point eight to point four. So this is pretty sketchy. That's only half an order of magnitude there, so that's a little worrying. This one is five orders of magnitude, so this is really the great example. So, you know, you might be able to argue that this isn't really, could be fit by other things, of course. Interesting, interesting. Terrible plot, these are dreadful plots. There's no question, they're dreadful plots, but they also have some badness in here. Anyway, fitting straight lines, we're gonna measure these quantities, da 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 da. Again, these are very different spaces, uh, and this is this is the claim, right? So this is the measured W, which is the one that's sitting up here for um, how much stuff is being, um, how much how much how the cost is decreasing with how much stuff is being made, and then this other one, which we're getting out of the other two measures. So they they should match up, I suppose. But uh, let's see. So yeah. So there are about 60 things we'd have to dig through it all. Um, uh, but I don't know if there's any obvious grouping there. Anyway, the upshot of this is that this Moore's Law story applies really generally. 
and connecting it to the speed up. And let me put that speed up. Should put that in. Okay. Interesting. Uh, last thing in, in all of this sort of stuff is going to be, uh, well, I had this at the start. This is a size range for biology. Um, so 21 orders of magnitude. So maybe seven roughly for length scales because this is uh, um, grams. So this is the weight. And then the number of cell types, right? So to make more and more complex systems, Biology's done pretty well with not a lot, right? There's not a lot of different cells in here. And ultimately, you know, so many atoms and so on. Uh, when we build systems, you know, we can do this too, right? Or we can start to make more of a mess of things. And so uh, it's an interesting paper. It's from a while ago, but this is, and again, these plots aren't great, but this is the number of Lego pieces and the number of types. So this is a tokens and types in sets. Um, a popular idea, I suppose, right? But this is, uh, you know, how does that scale? And so this is a, uh, it's about a point, so, so maybe a two thirds. That there's a, as the boxes have gotten bigger, the number of types get bigger, uh, you know, there are more types. Now biology doesn't do that really as much, right? It tends to evolve more complex things but it just has this set of building blocks it can use, right? Ultimately, you know, there are a bit, just a bunch of atoms. So that's, a, that's a, a small set. And of course, all of, let's say, all of English literature has been manufactured with, you know, well, at different times, 26 letters and a few other things. Uh, so that's a kind of impressive performance. So you can measure this for different systems. Uh, this is the... Um, the yeah, see, I'll, I could reframe all this, but this is the the, the number of nodes in a, in a system. This is the number of types. So this this is tokens. This is types. Um, and then there's this kind of scaling idea here. It's a bit funny. You might want to put this up the other way round. Um, no, that's okay. That's okay. So I'm going to write a note for myself here. This is also um, Heap's law. So let's find Heap's law in language. This is a slightly different law. And I'll stop there a minute. So if you're reading through a text, this is, so you're reading through a text, you're reading through Moby Dick, it's just word, 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 word. And this is the number of different words you've encountered as a function of time. And so this is a typical scaling here. So that 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 um, exponent is less than one, right? Because if you if it was one, then every word is new and completely different. We'll come back to this with innovation of systems as a very sort of you know if this is t if you sort of think of this as narrative time or just time, right? So this could be evolution and how many species we have, da da da, right? So it's a pretty it's a very this is a very general story this is a bit oddly you know there's nothing no mention of heaps law in this paper it's a bit oddly put together um but this is the inverse of it right okay so uh so if it's low then you have very specialized parts because you're getting many right as you're going through the system you have many different different pieces different types so it's types and tokens and then uh um, if you uh, you know have a lot of tokens but only a few types, they're made constitute out of a few types, then um, it's strongly combinatorial. So so again, 26 letters, some punctuation, right? You we, in a space, you can get a long way. We do. Um, so that's a, that's a good example of that. And then there's a claim in this paper, at least, that natural selection produces these uh, these kinds of high combinatorial systems. But we can we can do that as well. But we also tend to, and, and Lego sets are sort of the um, uh, somewhat bemoaned example of right. So there's tiny little pieces that are very specialized, and that's increasingly happened. But they went through and tried to measure all these things. Um, and where's their D? It's, uh, where's their little funny D? Yeah, this thing. Right. So lots of things. So so. Um, 
you know, universities looking at faculty, like how you know specialized they are, businesses, ant colonies. So ant colonies are going to be in this category. This is this high combinatorial piece. Um, and when you go to cell organisms, it's the same sort of story, right? So nature's making things out of just a few parts, but we tend to, you know, for good and bad, produce lots, uh, have systems with lots of little different kinds of pieces. Of it. Okay, I could refine that. That's uh, good for this section. So, I mean, I just sort of front the scaling piece. It's just a grab bag of pieces. Uh, there are different stories for why they can, you know, different kinds of scales come into exist. Not every complex system that you will find, you know, has some beautiful scaling story, right? Could be just you're going from regime to regime to regime, right? We aren't, uh, you know, it ends up with a kind of false thinking that you might, like, well, homunculi, right? They've got a little person inside us and a little person inside them um, because that's sort of explicable. But it is, it is broadly... Um, you know, writ large all over the place. Uh, you can get a long way with dimensional analysis and this allometry is sort of the big term here. You know, isometry happens everywhere, of course. Allometry kind of gets us a little bit interested and physicists might sneak in the door and say, oh, I can explain that for you. But, um, you know, if, if, if the dimensional analysis stuff breaks, then you're like, well, maybe there's some other weird, weird system. Okay. Yes, physicists like to say things like this. Okay. Um, so one of the problems, right? So if you think of something like the normal distribution, which is everywhere in nature, we have a beautiful story for how that arises. And you, we'll, uh, we'll kind of pass through a, a part of the journey. We'll go through that. But um, the central limit theorem, right? So there's sort of this one big story that explains how you get to that over and over and over. But you can get to these kinds of scalings through lots of different paths. And that that's fine. It's just the way it is, but it's um, it means you know we can have well it means uh, people can fight with each other. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, I'm going to start quickly on this next bit because I want to make sure you have this a little bit. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Oh, I don't have the thing. Hmm. Does anyone have a piece of paper they could donate to the cause. Let me see if I can do this. I may, I may, I may need it. Let me see. I realize somehow I didn't bring all my little bits of paper. Okay, so let me see. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Don't worry about this. Okay, so money, I said it's belief. Um, let's see how you do with this. So these are gonna be just two questions about the Wealth distribution in the in the U.S. It's not necessarily now. It's like sort of 2010. Um, let me write this. Two name. Thank you. I printed out and everything. I used a real printer. Um, Quantile four. The richest and the poorest. Okay, so here are some questions then. Um, That's what I want you to do, and I just write it down or have it fixed in your head because I'll hand around this piece of paper and I just want you to write it in. You should put your name next to it. Um, so but you, you need to gonna write, you, you need to do this. You're gonna write down five numbers that add up to 100. Qu they're quintiles, which are a little weird, but they're quintiles. And so what it is is um, what, so that we're going to do it like this. So that we take uh, the wealth of the U.S. that is owned by people. There's the top 20% of the wealth, the next 20%, and the bottom 20%. So the question is, of the top 20% of, you know, so we're going to rank people. You know, we'll take Bezos or whoever it is, Musk or whatever, and rank to the poorest person, right? And then you will put them in 20% blocks. How much wealth does that first 20% have in terms of percentage of the overall wealth? The next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. So that's the, the game. So, so there's the top 20. There's going to be, um, so we'll call that quint quintile one. Then there's quintile two. This is the piece of paper you'll get. 
quintile five. So this is so this is the richest. So I'll hand this piece of paper. If you fill it in, I'll, I'll bring in. I'll you know make some. I'll make some graphs on what you said, and we can compare to past groups. But again, so these are the percentage of wealth uh, owned by each quant each quintile. Right, so we're ordering everyone. There's, da -da 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 -da, there's all these people. It's a terrible thing to do, horribly, because someone like Musk is here. And then um, they're the top 20%. They own some fraction, which has to be more than 20%. Right, so the, so the limits are 100, 0, 0, 0, 0. And I'm just telling you this because this is confusing. This is where everyone has the same amount. And this is where... Well, the top in the top twenty percent is all the wealth, and it could be that, you know, the, the real limit of it is there's just one person who has money and no one else has anything. That's the most unequal situation we can get. So, have that written down. I'm going to hand this around. I want you to fill it in. You have it in your head. Yes. All right. So just pass it around. I think we can do that. Yes. And don't, whatever other, anyone else has done, we'll have a few more of these in this class. Whatever anyone else has done, please don't re react to that. Have yours in your head. Okay, so one more piece of paper, please. Okay, so the first thing I'll tell you is what do you think it is? And then the next piece of paper is what do you think it should be? So this is total opinion. You don't have to put your name. No one's going to. Uh, that's true. You don't have to put your name. There's, there's some others where, you, where I need that. But what should it be? This is totally your opinion, right? No name. Quintile one, right, two. Okay, so what should it be? Same thing. You don't have to put your name. I'm just like the border every day, so it, it just won't, like they will know if I put like 10, 20, 20 hours. They will, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Um, put it somewhere in the middle, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. The lack of uh, privacy for you. Yeah. Just you know, try to. So the first piece of paper is what you think it is and what you think it should be. All right. And I'll ask you a couple of other questions as we kind of wrap this up. So okay. I'll talk about this a little bit more. But so I just want to say we're terrible with probability. I just want to say that we, we can do some things with probability quite well, but it's hard. It's just hard. And we're not really homo, you know, risk and all these things. We, we're odd characters when it comes to this. We can get some things really well, but yeah. Anyway, so anyway, so um, this is some stuff. But I just want to ask you this question. And if you've seen it, just, you know, bear with me, I suppose. But so a parent has two children. So I'm going to ask you this, this question here. Um, and this is one we can answer now. So what's the probability that both children are girls? So we're going to choose a random parent from the U.S. such that they have two children. They're not twins, just two children. One fourth. So one fourth, right? So um, there's, a, there's a, a, a child born and then another child born. Right? Again, not twins. So there's a, we're going to say there's a 50-50 chance for boy-girl, just right. Um, so... A half and then a half. So a quarter. Yes? Feels okay? <laughs> well, that's true. Well, which one is which? Prevalent. What's the birth? What's the birth? 
ratio for girls to boys? What is it? There are more boys. Because they don't make it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that seems to be the story, right? I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, and it's across the world. This is not a, yeah. I know, no, I, I don't mean to put it, but it is, it's odd, right? I mean, I think that's really surprising. Yeah, you gotta look it up. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Um, so, all right, so we're gonna do this again. We have a parent who has two children, and we know one of them is a girl. So there's a slight, we're gonna change the question. You, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to, yeah. Um, so we know one of them is a girl, right? What's the probability that both children are girls? 50%, okay? So we went from a quarter to 50%. So the framing is, is we have to think about, okay. We know one of them is a girl. So the other thing would be, what's the other one? Yeah. yeah it's, right. It's and this this is because it's, you know, this is the terribleness of these questions, right? So it's, um, it's, we know one of them is a girl. So you could have, what we could have now is we've gone to the population. We've found a random person for which this is true. So they could have had a girl and then a boy or a boy and then a girl. Th these are these are all the people who have two children. And so the first question was this these are this is 50 right this is and this is time right so this is first child second child. So in this case there was there's one in a quarter chance. But now we've moved to this. It doesn't say which one is the girl. We know one of them is a girl. They could both be girls. So this is the this is what we're in now. We've conditioned ourselves to this case. So these sequences are this likely, right? Right, right. So that's already and it's yes. This is why the Monty Hall show worked for so long. Also, they cheated, but you know, like it's just. We don't know. It's just terrible. This is terrible. You should be. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Please don't hate me. It's not my fault. Okay. So, so now it's a third, right? So shifted from a half to a third. So now it's much lower. But we, you have to, whenever anyone asks you these things, first of all, you should just leave the room. No, don't do that. But I mean, you should just say no. Just take your money. Um, the, three card, the, the three card thing, I was with an aunt of mine. Who was showing me around New York City, and she knows everything and stuff. And um, and there was one of the dudes with the the little briefcase thing, and um, and there was a couple other people, and kind of floating around. There's a bit of a crowd around them, and they had the three cards, and one of them's a queen. And they're doing the thing, and it was so good because she he he had someone lined up here, and probably was part of it, and you could see what was going on, right? Sort of. But they got it wrong and lost their money. And then he just pointed to my aunt and said, what about you? What do you think it is? And it just feels like it's not even a gamble, right? It's just like, what do you think? And she's like, oh, you know, she sort of knows. She's very cocky. And then um, he says, well, how much money you got? It's a wallet. It's like $50. And, just, um, and of course, they've done these things where, you know, you have no idea because they've just like dropped them before they've changed them. And um, anyway, the $50 disappeared and so did they. It was very impressive. Know the See, it's hurting you, isn't it? Yeah. What is it? We changed the, we changed the question, so instead of saying we know one of them is a girl, we know the first child. Oh, uh, that's yes, 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 yes. So we know the first one's a girl. Then we're this is this is all that. Then you've got yes, yeah, 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 yeah. and that's it. <laughs> but you know, it is a tricky question. Okay, so here's the next question. So fourth and third. And we'll leave with this. So now we know one of them is a girl born on a Tuesday. 
what's the probability that both of them are girls? That's the question I will leave you with. Same question as the last one, which was already painful. And we just added the one who was born on Tuesday. All right. Okay, think about that. And if you could give me those uh, pieces of paper back, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go over and set up office hours, which can be on Teams, or you can come to my office. We'll try to do the whole thing. But thank you. And stay safe.